Galfast High School. 809 pupils, 32 teachers, 36 if you count the art department, one headmaster, just about, and Eric Slatt, deputy head from hell. Welcome to the stressed, very, concrete jungle of the thoroughly modern comprehensive, where only the science department matters a damn, where exam results, league tables are the only reality, and only the gifted children get an education, because it's so much more worthwhile. Easy. Welcome to the twisted world and stalled career of Eric Slatt. Deputy head, trapped just below his forties, and a marginally sane headmaster, seething with fury at the encroaching dangers of socialism, art subjects, and single parent families. Dreaming one day of his own school, where all the kids wear uniforms and the science department has consumed the entire curriculum. Meet Susie Travis, fresh out of teacher training college and the lone voice of sanity at Galfast High. And she dearly hopes the number one thorn in the side of Eric Slatt. It's great. Just do it like that. <laughs> it's like a really bad newsreader. The two series of the Strident Fast Chalk, broadcast in 1997, were the climax of a seven-year collaboration between a writer and a producer who cut their teeth in television in the late 80s. I've been producing shows in the West End for, um, uh, for 10 years or so, and also promoting lots of comedians from uh, Victoria Wood, Rowan Atkinson, Dave Allen, uh, uh, and many others. And um, when a number of my friends started up their own... Um, uh, independent television production companies, uh, rather after I'd been running my theatre production company for some time, it was too good an opportunity to resist, particularly as I was dealing with writers all the time anyway. Stephen Moffat was a uh, young teacher, um, and his dad, Bill Moffat, was a headmaster. But at the school they were filming um, Highway, the um, ITV religious programme with Harry Seacombe. Bill Moffat had a wonderful idea for a uh, TV show about a young school newspaper, and yeah, the production team, yeah, sounds quite fun. Um, and Bill said, Ooh, if we're going to do this show, could my son have a go? When the production team considered it the best debut script they'd ever seen from a, a new writer. Press Gang was absolutely sensational. The director, Bob Spears, introduced me to Stephen Moffat, who was a fellow Scotsman uh, of Bob's, and he sent me a script of what he thought a sitcom set in a school would be like. Uh, and I thought it was terrific. It was very good. So. I had lunch with him to talk about it more. And he was going through his divorce at the time, and he couldn't talk about this sitcom, about the school at all. All he could talk about, very, very, very humorously, was uh, the horrors of his divorce. So we got to the end of lunch, and I said, well, look, Stephen, I'm not going to commission you to write the um, school sitcom, but how about writing a sitcom about your divorce? And that took us into the pilot of Joking Apart, which was commissioned in pretty well record time by the BBC. I think it was uh, three months between sending them the um, script and uh, being in pre-production. Stephen's a fabulous writer, uh, very, very funny, sharp character. And after Joking Apart, I suggested that we returned to the school sitcom. Right! Who prayed for that? <laughs> I was on a bit of a nice road, actually, the, when, when this came up. I'd been in the theatre um, doing a play called My Night with Reg at the Royal Court. I'd then been asked to play Mr Collins in Pride and Prejudice. I think it was my second job. I think it was my... Oh, no, I'd had two little tiny jobs before. This was my first proper television job. When the BBC commissioned the series, they, of course, wanted a, a star name, and um, Angus Deaton was a friend of mine, and I knew that he was desperate to get into a bigger performing role away from uh, um, Have I Got News For You?, I just couldn't uh, convince him to do it. I mean, we felt that David was the, uh, by far the better and more accomplished actor. I was 40 by that point, 41, and um, I'd done quite a lot of television and theatre, but it just felt sort of, you know, a nice thing to be happening. I lived in a, in a, in a house with three friends. We hadn't been out of university very long, and we were all at the beginnings of our careers. And I look back now and see where all four of us are. And it's, it's, quite, it's quite frightening. It's over a decade. I had a lovely time at the interview. I had such a laugh. Juliet was lovely, Juliet May, the director, and we had a laugh. I thought, this is ridiculous. No one's going to give me this job. It's absolutely pointless. And I went, I remember going to the audition in that spirit. I was so relaxed because I thought, this is, this is completely pointless. 
no one is going to give me such a, a huge responsibility, only ever having done about pff, 10 lines previously on camera. And I think that was the reason I got the job, because I was just convinced that I was going to walk in and they were going to go next. I went in wearing that blue cardigan and that pink um, shirt I had, a 1930s pink shirt I'd found in Brighton. And I thought, I know what this woman looks like. And I got there and, of course, it was the audition place was full of terribly good, gifted and well-known actresses. And I thought, well, this is just not going to work. I remember the audition so clearly. It was in this sort of cavernous hall for some reason. So you had to do this sort of walk of... of it should have been a walk of terror, but it just made me laugh. You, it was a very long walk down to a table where Juliet was sat. I think Stephen was there as well. I can't actually remember that. He probably was. And it was one of those auditions that went... Inc now I know that went... Inc I understand it went incredibly well because I was, I was so relaxed and thought the whole thing was ridiculous. If I could take that into every audition, I'd, I'd, I'd be working constantly. I vaguely remember the audition. Truth be told, I remember the audition just about as well as I remember anything else about the job. What would it be about 12 years ago? I think I had two auditions. And it was the first time I'd met Juliette May, who was our director, who I've subsequently worked with four or five times, and I thought she was lovely. But I just remember having a really good time and it really getting on with Juliet and both of us laughing a lot. We all giggled a lot and I had a nice time and then the bonus was I got a phone call saying you've got the gig. Me coming out and thinking, well, you know, the, the worst case scenario is that I've met this really lovely director, so. And I remember like, getting to a phone box, phoning my agent and saying, no, you, know, I, you know, they all seem very nice, I haven't got it, no way I've got the job, but they all seem very nice, so I didn't embarrass myself. Luckily, I, I suppose they wanted a, a team of people who weren't famous and gave it to me. Perhaps everybody else turned it down, you never know. Dedication to her roles may have swung it too. Amanda was famously the only main cast member willing to have her head shaved for her role in the controversial 1982 BBC series The Cleopatras. I said if I've got to have it done, I would rather that nobody else did. So, um, And then I, I lost faith in it. I looked like an egg with no makeup on. It's terrific with makeup, but I, I was worried, and I got. They made me the most wonderful wig. I described what I would always like to have as hair, and they gave it to me. And they had to do another one because it was so prickly. When you've just had your head shaved for the first time, it's incredibly sensitive. And also, the makeup they made us wear was a new thing. It was yellow, but it made two of us, Pauline Moran and I, just blow up. You know, we looked like George III at the end of the first filming day, so everything hurt. I had two wigs, which I think got me more work than probably I would have got without them. With the cast of Chalk now in place, but only one script written, Moffat set about tailoring the characters to his chosen performers, and in particular, his leading man. Stephen was then writing to the actor, and David started taking the part down uh, a particularly manic route. Will you, for God's sake, get out here! Perfect for Stephen. It's exactly the sort of thing he likes writing, and he, he very much rose to what David was doing with the part. Eric is very ambitious. I think that the collision of his ambition with his particular personality, which is obviously does not deal with stress and anxiety very well, and his refusal to really listen to anybody else lead to the much of the comedy. There was a history teacher there who told the kids that Napoleon had an Eric Slat complex. The whole thing really revolves around Slat as a character. Much more than about the school, I think, it's about Slat. It's about him and his <laughs> twisted, neurotic, desperate, personality. Yes! Eric is holding everything together. He's on his own. He's, he's got his finger in that dam and he's not, you know, he's not moving. The extraordinary thing is that the character is totally unlikable and yet we as an audience go with him to the end. Expel any girl with makeup and learning difficulties. <laughs> yes, Mr. Stanley. Even though often he is, he does, says and does the most appalling things. You're always, you're always on his side because he's in charge of a group of imbeciles. No, no, I just meant you could have slid the key underneath. Oh, of course. <laughs> he is a sick man. He is a sick man. I need help. You certainly do. I wanted to be a teacher, actually, for a long time when I was growing up. Um, and in fact, I applied to teach training college, Bretton Hall, indeed, where I think John Godber went, who writes a lot. But, um, and I wanted to teach 
sort of drama and English. No drama teachers, it's a communal shower. <laughs> I ended up going to do a drama degree at Bristol University. I didn't become a teacher, probably, probably in much relief, or that the, 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 there should be great relief amongst the student population. Well, on your way, then. Don't keep your teacher waiting. I am a teacher. What? I'm a teacher. No, you're not. I've never been um, that keen on, on research. <laughs> I didn't do much. I did talk to some friends who were teachers and talk to them a bit about some of the storylines and they just said, yeah, it sounds great. It's clearly the, the, whoever's written this knows about teachers. I come from a family of teachers. I managed to escape my uh, dad's uh, physics teacher. My mother used to um, want to be a teacher. My brother's a PE teacher. Everything I saw in chalk seem to fit um, every teacher I've kind of come in contact with, apart from my own family, C clearly, I, I never want to say that. We still respond well to teachers sharing that light, it's because we all remember them, you know, it's, uh, we, you know we've all had 15 years of uh, two or three dozen teachers and there's no adult in the country who can't remember three or four who seem to be on the sort of uh, barking end of reality. <laughs> Stephen captured that perfectly. Sorry, I thought you were a pupil. <laughs> Horribly based on me, I think. She's deeply neurotic, very romantic. She probably isn't a very good teacher, but she's a terribly nice person, and she is devotedly loyal to the school. Probably more from an area of teaching that Eric recognises, the kind of teacher he'd probably like to put out to grass prematurely. And if there's anything I can ever do... Shut up or I'll kill you. I just think everything about her is so sweet. And she does get so wrapped up in everything. I was punched by one of the pupils! Right. I think okay. she's a little Fine. in love with Slad. Name? Amanda Tripley. <laughs> and usually he has to sort out her problems. Yeah, the rest of us don't get a football in the face every time we cross the playground, you know. And when we do, the pupils don't count it as a goal. Oh, no, that was my suggestion. That's how we always used to play when I was a child. He makes it into a compliment, and then she remembers that it used to be a way of getting well, noticed at school. Are. I soon found out it was a jolly good way of making new friends, actually. Good, good. Where did Stephen get that from? Did he get it from somebody he went to school with? Did he ever? Was he ever? I mean, it's hysterical and very funny to play. He does very little apart from utter expletives, bollocks, buggers, turds, tossers, bumheads, arseheads, etc. That's all he does. A head of English who only swears, with one famous exception. Exactly! He's completely wonderful, and you see the show and he's completely part of it. I don't know how rewarding as an actor it is always to do something like that. I like to feel that when I play a character there's a certain reality in it, I couldn't for a long time find the reality of this creature who all he did was swear. I have received a number of complaints that pupils are picking up bad language in your classes. Bollocks! <laughs> the rehearsal room next to us was empty and I went there carrying with me my character briefcase and walked up and down, up and down, towards and away from the mirror with the briefcase in my hand going bollocks, bugger, etc, etc, saying the swear words over and over again, desperately hoping that I would somehow arrive at a realistic understanding of the character. And I think I kind of got away with it in the end. Dickheads. <laughs> He hates the school, he hates everybody in it. He hates the deputy head, he hates the head, he hates the head of music, he hates all the other teachers. He cannot bear the sight of them. He hates, above all else, the children. Arse face, bum head, twat! If you spoke to enough teachers, you'd find there are people in the school, uh, schools like that. And that in the staff room, um, the amount of sort of uh, swearing or contempt for students behind their back is quite high. In some cases, not all. Mr. Carpdale. The briefcase, by the way, was ever such an important prop to me as an actor, because when I was a schoolboy in the fifties, all of my teachers carried with them wherever they were going big, heavy briefcases and this became for me indelibly associated with the idea of a teacher. A lot of the characters are slightly cartoony but there are elements 
of Janet. I think that uh, we could all recognise the stressed, overworked, slightly harassed wife of um, a character like Eric Slatt. Sorry, Mrs Thompson, he'll be with you in a moment. I mean, can you imagine working all day with Eric and then going home and having to <laughs> make the make the stir-fry with Eric? No, claws off me, slat queen! 